This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Hello and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, and it never got quiet. This is a half hour program that explores the Hawaiian connection with the Vietnam War. I'm your host, Vic Kraft. Our guest today is Ken Kupchik. Ken had one of the more obscure but nonetheless critical jobs in Vietnam, and that was predicting the weather, a skill more akin to an art as opposed to a science. It is, however, much unappreciated or underappreciated. The D-Day landings at Normandy in the invasion of Europe and the subsequent defeat of Nazi Germany hinged on the weather forecast of a young Royal Air Force Group Captain Meteorologist. More than one operation in history has been upset by Mother Nature. At least one attempt by the Mongols to invade Japan in the 13th century was interrupted not by an army or navy, but by what appears to be a series of typhoons the Japanese call the Divine Wind. We know it better as Kamikaze. Before Ken was commissioned in the United States Air Force, he went to Cornell University and received a degree in chemistry. He subsequently earned a degree in meteorology from Penn State. Ken served on General Mo Meyer's staff as weather briefing officer in Saigon. In 1968, he served on the University of Hawaii's meteorology research staff prior to returning to Cornell to obtain a law degree specializing in international affairs. We can spend the rest of the program listing Ken's accomplishments as a lawyer. Suffice us to say, Ken has been practicing law in Hawaii since he was licensed and has a catalog of accomplishments in contributing to the body of law pertaining to acquisition, construction, and community development, as well as lending his writing talents to publications on numerous law-related subjects. If you're interested in Ken's career, you can visit hawaii.com, uh, hawaiilawyer.com, and get the full, de full details. Aloha and welcome, Ken. Aloha, Vic. Good to be here. Thank you. I noticed uh, your career, you started off uh, in chemistry in the sciences. Uh, how did you end up as a meteorologist? Well, it was a long story, but it started with Sputnik. Go for it. Yes. <laughs> in 1957, uh, Sputnik went up and we had to beat the Russians, and so most of us went off to sciences. and math or science or engineering. So I went off to college in that area. At the same time, we uh, started having some trouble in the South and some sit-ins and the like. And as a chemist, I thought maybe I wouldn't be able to be a good citizen. So I decided I better go to law school at some point and uh, figure out how to work the system, understand it and the like. So I would planned to do that, but I was in ROTC and I had a four-year commitment uh, to the Air Force and wanted to fly, but my eyes got too bad. And they sent me to Penn State, and I got my meteorology degree and was their weatherman for the next four years. Was it your career chosen for you, or was it one of those things that you had uh, as a choice of uh, maybe five or six different careers? Well, I thought I'd fly, and uh, when that, they told me I couldn't do that, I picked this one, and ah. it was the only one that came up on my radar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, predicting the weather is much more of an art than it is a science, uh, especially in Southeast Asia. Uh, it had to have been a, a heck of a challenge uh, just to come up with a forecast uh, for the next five minutes, uh, never mind predicting what tomorrow's operations are going to face. Can you tell us some of the difficulties you might have had? Well, first <laughs> difficulty was that most of us are trained in temperate meteorology, so they sent me to Rantoul, Illinois to learn tropical meteorology in November and December. So that was, that was a struggle. 
Well, this is uh, the military we're but, talking uh, about. In the tropics, the weather <laughs> operates a little differently, but North Vietnam is even more challenging in that North Vietnam and China were the only two countries at the time who were not on the world meteorological net. Oh. And so on the weather map, where you have all the stations reporting in, two blanks there at uh, China and North Vietnam, and that's where a lot of the key weather came from. How did you guys overcome that? Well, we had uh, uh, covert people in the ground that I could talk to. We had uh, constellations that would circle out in the Gulf of Tonkin that I could talk to. I could talk to all the pilots in the air at any time. And more importantly, we also had the first version of satellites that came through. So we were able to, uh, they only make one pass a day around, but you get a cloud picture in the visual spectrum, and it would help you a little bit. Hmm. So you guys uh, basically were responsible for not only providing uh, forecast information for in-country operations, but also for the folks over in Thailand who were bombing the north? Uh, right. Our, the in-country operations were mostly uh, where we had total air control. The Army would go almost no matter what our weather forecast was, except for during Quezon and Tet. Uh, but over the north, we were in a hostile environment. We had the NM range and the tropics. Uh, clouds would go up to 60,000 feet, and they had to go from Thailand into Hanoi, fly over the range, refuel somewhere around those big clouds, drop their ordnance, and then come back over the range. So it was, it was pretty difficult. The, um, in those days, you had to take evasive action by visual acquiring the SAMs, MIGs, or ACAC. So if you didn't have visual flight rules or three miles visibility and three-eighths cloud cover, uh, you couldn't see your target. That must have been <laughs> terribly frustrating, not only for you, but for the operations people. Uh, if you couldn't see the target, you can't see what you're going to be bombing. So I would imagine... And your life's in danger. And your life's in danger, of we course. We a 100 planes up in a mission, and, sure. and if you didn't have the right environment, you'd wasted all that money and probably the lives of some people. Yeah, that was... Uh, I remember uh, we were talking about uh, Jack Broat and, and Thud Ridge and mm -hmm. going downtown and his books, and yeah. you mentioned a couple of other books dealing with uh, the operations in the north. Yeah. Uh, basically telegraphing where we were coming and when we were coming. Right. And, and then piling on top of that, the, uh, the, the very, the vagaries of weather. <laughs> well, the missions were, to get in two missions a day, we had a bomb at 8 a.m. and at 4 p.m. <laughs> because the planes had to go from Thailand to Hanoi, back to Thailand, back to Hanoi, and back. So you can only get two missions in a day. And if they, we didn't show up at 8, they knew we were coming at noon and there would only be one mission. <laughs> so the rest of the day they could operate without... Well, uh, well how convenient. I mean. <laughs> yeah. well, the Navy was a little different. This was the Air Force. Yeah. The Navy's out in the Gulf, and I guess they could fly at different times. The Air Force, where I was, uh, provided the weather to the Air Force and to the Army. Well, I think the Air Force probably had a lo longer distance to go, because yes. uh, considering Yankee Station was a whole lot closer to Hanoi and, and Haiphong yeah. and uh, coming out of uh, Takli or Karat or wherever. Yeah, we used to, we divided the north into six, what we call route packages, and three of them were Air four of them I think were Air Force and two of them were Navy. And they had Haiphong and one part of Hanoi and we had the rest of uh, the western part where Dien Bien Phu was and the southern part. Right. North Vietnam, and I did the go no go forecasts for the missions over the north. How how stable were those forecasts? Not not reflection on your ability, but uh, I mean, did Mother Nature cooperate most of the time? Well, one time I told them that it'd be clear in 15 miles visibility, and they got there and it was a typhoon. <laughs> <laughs> for, for a pilot, that's a difference day and night. Yeah. And for the meteorologist, it was a difference in 15 miles on a forecast. That's true. Uh, the typhoons would suck the moisture into them, and there's usually a clear air mass right in front. And so for two, two, three days, we'd been bombing in that clear air mass. We thought it was going to move into Hainan Island, and it moved 15 miles to the west. Unfortunately, it was on our route. <laughs> so that's why it was, that was not so much fun. You were telling me earlier about uh, having to scrub some of the missions uh, based on weather. Uh, you, as you said, 100 aircraft up in the air, and they've got to be refueled. Uh, and again, if they're going in country, and if you're scrubbing the mission, and then they have to go back, what do they do? Well, 
um, we didn't have the full say on what, whether it hit the target or not. Washington, D.C. played a big role in the decision-making. We had our frag teams who would set the targets together, and uh, I'd brief the um, decision-maker, the general, uh, two hours before, and uh, they'd make a decision to go. And sometimes when we were en route, refueled, or perhaps over the Gulf, uh, Washington would call and scrub the mission. So the pilots would have to drop their ordnance in the Gulf and fly back home, their lives at stake and the like. Uh, this didn't sit well with the military people in Vietnam, and the generals and the colonels in the command post were complaining up one side and down the other about Washington not understanding our mission. And then uh, some years later, when I got to law school, uh, we had Nicholas Katzenbach, who was one of the people at the other end of the line, had been Johnson's attorney general, came up to a cocktail party that we had at our law review. And so I explained to him my story, and his response was, those darn generals, they didn't know what was going on out there. <laughs> now, my, my point on this story is that not that one side was right and the other was wrong, but we had a significant communication problem between the field and home. And I observed that because I sat in the command post of MACV and uh, Seventh Air Force for the year that I was there, and I saw most of the decisions were made, and we'd used to brief the senators and the congressmen that they'd come down on the climatology and other things, and I'd be there for the body count briefing and the other things. But uh, it was quite apparent to me, at my mouse in the room or the fly on the wall, that uh, we had a significant communication gap. Hmm. I wonder if that has been resolved <laughs> in the intervening years. I, I don't want to know. <laughs> uh, you didn't get the opportunity to travel much uh, throughout country, uh, did you? I was not allowed to tr leave the Saigon area because I had a special intelligence clearance, and therefore I was not cleared to travel anywhere else. Mm. Part of that had to do with the, the type of information I was receiving in order to make my forecasts. At the time you were there, we were receiving an awful lot of information about terrorist activity that was going on in Saigon, in fact, other large metropolitan areas within the South. Did you happen to experience any or see any? Well, a couple of things. One, I felt uh, for the first 10 months I was there, I was safer in Saigon than I was in New York City. My previous posting was on eastern Long Island at Suffolk County Air Force Base. And, you know, is the city safe? You know, we used to go to the city all the time. but. I thought it was safer in Saigon. Uh, the last two months, the offensive hit and changed everything. Nothing was safe at that point. But one example of safety, <laughs> we, there was a golf course, the Saigon Country Club, and um, they had crabgrass greens on it because you couldn't grow the grass low enough. It would burn out in that heat on it. And uh, the uh, bunkers were real bunkers. They were manned <laughs> with machine guns and sandbags. They were regular. They were the sandbag. They were the bunkers for the golf course, but they were banned. And during that period of time, and during Tet, uh, the biggest, some of the biggest battles were fought on the golf course, as the, uh, the insurgents came through, and there were quite a few people killed where we were playing golf on it. So, hopefully, you weren't playing golf at the same time that they were running their operation. I, I, have, I had well. The night before was when they celebrated Tet, and uh, it's time to chase the spirits away and a lot of fireworks. From the time it was dark till after midnight, it was as light as day just from little fireworks going off. Mm. And so it was something like I've never seen. You know, we have New Year's and other things we celebrate here, but it's quite small change compared to the constant roar through the whole time and the light that was put off just by the little firecrackers all through a city of three million people. The next night, uh, when I went home, I lived a mile off base, that a bicycle went to and from the base. Uh, we had been warned that there's something was going to happen, but no one thought too much about it. And the explosion started uh, middle of the night, and we said, oh, darn, there's more fireworks out there. And then they kept going and getting louder. and. Um, we turned on Armed Forces Radio and they said, stay in place, don't try to come in. They had come through the perimeter at Tonsonute. They were firing in the streets throughout on it. And so for two days, I was trapped there at our villa. We start going up on the roof to watch the gunships shoot buildings two blocks away and things like that. 
and uh, then the shrapnel started coming over the roof, so it was time to hide under our beds. It was myself and one other guy. There were six of us GIs that rented this villa. The two of us were there. The rest were on base at the time. And so we had one old M1 rifle between us, and we hid under our bed. <laughs> Until two days later, they told us it was safe to come in. And so we uh, walked up the mile to the base. And uh, the MP battalion, I think, was the only thing there at the beginning. And now they brought in the Big Red One. And I looked at them, and they were about 17 year old. And they looked more scared than I was. I didn't get off for two more weeks, slept on the floor in the command post, and they finally said it was safe to get off. We'll get back to you in a minute on that, Ken. I'd like to hear some more about uh, Tet. But first, let's uh, have some messages. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hello, I'm Helen Dora Hyden, the host of Voice of the Veteran, seen here live every Thursday afternoon at 1 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. As a fellow veteran and veterans advocate with over 23 years experience serving veterans, active duty, and family members, I hope to educate everyone on benefits and accessibility services by inviting professionals in the field to appear on the show. In addition, I hope to plan on inviting guest veterans to talk about their concerns and possibly offer solutions. As we navigate and work together through issues, we can all benefit. Please join me every Thursday at 1 p.m. for the Voice of the Veteran. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Marcia Joyner, inviting you to navigate the journey. Spend the time with us as we look through and discover all of the ins and outs of this journey through life. We're on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. And I would love to have you with us. Come navigate the journey. Aloha. We're talking with Ken Kupchak uh, about his experiences in Vietnam. Uh, particularly, uh, we were just get, uh, talking about Tet. Uh, you've got a couple more stories uh, about Tet. Uh, you said mentioned something about uh, your first day back at work after. Uh, oh no! First day I got off base. Uh, Tet hit. Was stuck off for two days. Got in. I had to sleep on the floor for 10 days till they cleared out things. Mm -hmm. The people had come through the perimeter. We put about 400 bodies in a common grave near the end of the runway. Townspeople come out and put flowers on their graves. <laughs> so you didn't feel like you were real comfortable. They finally let us go off, and I went to my place, which was a mile off base. And that night, 100 rounds of rocket fire came into Tansanut. So we ran up to the roof again, we had a flat top roof uh, in our building. And uh, a big fire going on. They, they had hit the a BOQ and, and a, a chapel, and they were burning up. And I'm taking pictures and pictures and pictures. And I finally noticed I had taken 40 shots on a 24 shot roll. <laughs> and uh, what I, I was so scared, I guess I had ripped the sprocket holes on the first one. And the, all of them were taken on the same frame. <laughs> but the worst part about the, the rocket attack was that they hit uh, the PX and got the beer supply and the shaving cream. Oh, dear. So there was shaving cream all over the place, and the beer supply was hit, and so everybody was fighting mad. <laughs> that <point. laughs> so, but there was another time uh, when I got back in after that, they issued me a, an M16 and a 38 revolver. Uh, I had had a half hour of pistol training at summer camp in the summer of 62 at Langley Air Force Base, and I'd never been given any instruction on an M16 and I would go back and forth on a bicycle. So I'd be pedaling around with my M16 strapped on and my pistol on my, my hip. And one time when I was going along the perimeter road, I could hear the <laughs> you know, And the first thing I did was I'd jump off and grab my camera. Fortunately, it hit the building across the road. And, <laughs> and from that point, I decided to hit the ground. <laughs> when you're young and dumb, and you do things like that. I'm uh, glad to be home. That's, that's funny you mentioned uh, young and dumb because uh, uh, in our group we were talking about the difference in age. You mentioned the 17-year-olds. Uh, the difference between a 17 and 8-year-old and or 18-year-old and a 21-year-old or a 25-year-old is like you're a million years old when you're when you're looking at that 21-year-old. Uh, uh, until yeah. they've been there about six months and yeah. they look like they're 80. Yeah, that's uh, about it. Uh, uh, 
you get old very quickly. Yeah. But uh, you can imagine how old we were because we were in our 20s. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was 24 and 25 when I was yeah. there. So. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. It's, it, 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 you did some time at the University of Hawaii uh, in the meteorology department. Uh, was that uh, after your active duty time? or It was immediately after. I processed out on my return. My wife's from here. We were going to spend about six months alone on the beach till uh, law school began. And um, I took her down to Alamona Court, played tennis, hit a drop shot. She went down, didn't get up. So we had to get a knee operation for her. Oh, dear. And the uh, day before, the covered it. We didn't have any insurance, so I had to go to work. And so I knew these fellows up at UH because they'd come through Saigon. Uh, we're doing a study on forecast methods for Southeast Asia. And because I had operational experience, I went up and knocked on their door and said, hey, you got room for me on this team? And they said, sure. And so I, I spent the next six months uh, developing forecast methods for Southeast Asia. And uh, this is the time, I think, that we may have discovered for the first time that our cone of storms were really hurricanes. As, as I said, satellites were coming in. We had Nimbus, which was would make our pass once a day or so, and or every so many hours. And we put all these pictures together, and we counted 12 of these storms from Mexico over to Southeast Asia. They were all kind of interconnected. And a couple of years ago here, you might have seen the paper with three of those storms connected. Uh, on a right, but if you go, this is the uh, least traveled part of the globe, 10 degrees north of the equator, roughly. People travel north and south in ships through it, but hardly anybody would go east-west where the weather moves. And so we, we found that the, these things existed, and every so often one would spin north, and they'd come by Hawaii or go into the Philippines, or if they didn't spin north, they'd head into Saigon at the end of their track uh, on it. So that was one of the things we discovered while I was there. We also found that it was storms like these that would suck all the moisture down, or the dry air down out of Siberia and clear out the Red River and the Black River Valley, so that's good bombing time for Hanoi, <laughs> so, which was the purpose of the study in some way. Oh, <laughs> benefits in uh, on one way, but um, learning how to uh, better kill other people, I guess. Well, it's yeah, all data. Is, yeah. Who uses it and how they want to use yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, I imagine uh, again dealing with the folks in Thailand uh, and giving them forecasts. Did you have any interface with the Navy at all? Uh, none. The Navy ran their aeronautics or aerologists. They don't have meteorologists. They have aerologists, but they ran their thing totally separate. Maybe at some level up at you know, Scott Air Force Base and the like, they communicated, but. In my four years, so we never had anything to do with the Navy. Talk about uh, inter-service rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> the shift from uh, science to law, how, how did that, you mentioned something about you wanted to practice law. Yeah. Uh, I, and you're waiting for the Cornell uh, time frame, getting there. You had this desire to do things or help people, I guess. I wanted to understand why our system seemed to be having so much trouble, which was the early 60s. Mm -hmm. And so I, I figured I needed to understand that, and getting a law degree was the best way to do that and become an active citizen. Uh, I got to law school, and I discovered that you can't write a law that I can't interpret more in one way, uh, which led me to believe that for what I know about our system, and I think I know a fair amount now, it's as good or better than anybody's around. The only difference is who's administering the system mm -hmm. because the executive gets the first shot at interpreting the law. And if you want to call the executive on it, you've got to go to court. And we do have an independent judiciary, but it takes time, uh, you know, sometimes two to five years to resolve that issue and not everybody can afford it. So the 80% of the time, whoever's in the executive branch gets the chance to interpret the law to do pretty much what they want. So that's what I learned at law school. <laughs> and I was no longer uh, so idealistic <laughs> on it. But uh, it's, uh, we, because of the laws we do have and the Bill of Rights and other things, I think we still have the best system that I've studied. And as you know, my degree was with some emphasis in international affairs. So yeah. we've, our, our fact that we have an independent judiciary 
puts us a little bit different than most other places and what makes it independent to a large degree is the lifetime appointments of the judges that they can't for the most part be caught under someone's thumb. They may be beholden to someone before they get there but once they get into a federal judgeship they're not beholden to anybody except for impeachment and there's perhaps been one or two of those in over 200 years of the United States. Well, I think of uh, you're talking about uh, beholden to anybody. I recall uh, so many of the chief justices and many of the other uh, associate justices who were uh, nominated by a president thinking that uh, that particular judge was going to go in and follow their philosophy yeah. and do a complete 180 on them. Yeah. So, first uh, of those was probably, yeah. not, maybe not the first, the first I'm aware of, it's Hugo Black, <laughs> senator from, I think it was Georgia or Alabama, goes on the court and becomes perhaps one of the most liberal justices there ever was uh, at the time. And then there's, of course, Justice Souter, who became known as the stealth justice because they had thought he was going to rule one way, and he turned out that he started ruling different ways from what they expected. Have any advice for returning veterans today, uh, uh, given your experience or, or given current circumstances? I'd get an education. Get an education. Yeah, it gives you more options. Uh, I was. Um, trustee at Mid-Pacific Institute for about 21 years and we learned that the kids going out of high school weren't trained uh, the way the employers needed them. They were trained based on a system that developed in industrial age where everything was lockstep and you do a production line and they do one thing for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Today our kids are uh, between six and twelve different jobs by the time they pass on and are um, Returning veterans have lost some time in grade. Best thing they can do is upgrade themselves and get an education, perhaps an education that allows them to be more flexible, to be able to collaborate and solve problems, hands-on work. Uh, no matter what the industry changes and the job changes, you'll have some ability to try to change with it and always have a place. So that's my take is get an education. Well. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate that, and uh, right. hopefully uh, some of our veterans will uh, take your advice. Okay. We would love to have some feedback. If you would like to be on our program or if you have some comments, please send us an email at 808vietnamvets at gmail.com. I would like to thank the staff here at Think Tech Hawaii for all their support and assistance. Truly, without them, this program would not be possible. Please come back again next week for another issue of It Never Got Quiet. Mahalo.